Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise in study the evolution of lower curves catfishes, also known as plecos or whiptail catfishes within the aquarium trade. And I've also got over sort of seven or more years experience in the trade and over 17 years um, experience, nearly 18 years with aquarium fishes. So today I'm going to talk about fish food and particularly the ingredients that people really don't like and these are termed as fillers because often the idea is that these foods actually are added to food to sort of bulk it out to increase the volume of the food and it might not always be what you think it is when it comes to whether it is actually a filler or whether it's not. So this is why people actually kind of hate the idea of fillers but aren't always aware of what's a filler and what isn't because it's not clear no brand is going to say this food is this is added to bulk out because in reality none of them are adding these foods really to bulk it out entirely or that's the entire aim of it so the main one i'm going to do well the first one really is cereals so cereals are added to a lot of fish foods and these have many different uh, roles. Sometimes there might be that nutritional role to them, but it really depends on the fishes you're keeping. And many fishes will not have the best digestibility of these, um, particularly when it comes to ornamental fishes. We aren't keeping the fishes that seals are often studied on, and these are like carp, salmon, salmon stuff like that, based on generalist feeders. So it's entirely kind of a different digestibility that we don't really know much about. The main reason though for cereals is they actually are binding agent so they help stick the food together which you'll find many of the there's many different types of binding ingredient, ingredients although I'm not a fan of cereals myself particularly in the volumes they use they use largely for herbivorous fishes to claim as a herbivorous ingredient they're totally different from algae um, protozoa, bacteria, stuff like that, that these fishes will be feeding on. And maybe they're feeding on plants, but the cereal crops are very difficult to digest. An argument is, well, it's fibre. We don't really know how each fish is going to relate to this sort of fibre idea or how they're going to, how much they use fibre. But I would say it's very differently from how mammals do based on how we digest our food compared to them with maybe a secondary pair of jaws or a different digestive tract, they're totally different evolutionary routes. So cereals I am not a fan of other than binding agents for these reasons. They're nothing like these fishes would be feeding on in the world and yes they might be beneficial to salmon and carp, not many of us really keep those outside and um, outside of the um, sort of koi and goldfish ideas so they're the ones that I would say definitely are a filler anyway so next one is binding agents and you'll see these throughout all the different fish foods so Rupashi has binding agents um, fish science has algae uh, so has binding agents you have spectrum has binding agents so does um, fluval so does tetra so does every single other brand unless it's frozen food or live food. Why? Because the food actually has to stick together. If you're just going to scatter it, the fishes probably aren't going to feed on it. There might be small exceptions, but if you have to, you're not going to get that pellet, that wafer, that gel food without some sort of binding agent that sticks the food together. And there's many different binding agents out there. So I mentioned cereals, but also fish meal can act as one. Um, they're particularly the ones you'll see in dry foods. The volumes needed I'm not particularly sure on, but sometimes they seem exceptionally high volume, especially for the fishes you're feeding. So maybe moving away from dry foods might even be the necessary move for something that will bind together for a certain amount of time. 
But the main thing when thinking about binding agents is also how long do you want this food to stay stuck together for. So it's, fair, it's fine to have something that will just bind for maybe a few minutes if you're feeding something like very fast feeding, so Bacillidae, so the, um, that's like guppies and stuff, uh, platys, or some very fast feeding cichlids. Um, tetra, anything like that that's going to feed on the top layers. It's fine if it doesn't break down, um, like if it, take, if it doesn't take hours to break down, it's fine for it to just take minutes. And otherwise you might want it to sit for quite a while of time, but you might not want it to sit for too long because it, it's probably just going to, it could just end up sitting there and decaying rather than going into the water column and maybe being broken down or collected by the filter. Um, and this is particularly useful, I think, when it comes to anything slow feeding. You want a binding agent that's going to last a few hours. And a lot of people complain about water going cloudy after feeding. This can be several things, but sometimes it's the binding agent. It's just breaking down too quickly, entering the water column and going straight in the filter. And binding agents massively vary in gel foods as well. Some will last three hours, some will last six hours, some will last 12, some will last 48. And it all depends on the actual um, aquarium itself. Temperatures affect it, the pH, so uh, the carbonates affect how long that food's going to stay stuck together for. Um, other than that, flow rate, it can cause like a bit of friction, so it just starts moving away so dispersing the food. Some foods you do want slow release anyway otherwise you just want the fish to be able to get to it because these guys can take a long time to get to food. So particularly like lower cards and stuff. Um, even though the catfish know there's foods quite quickly it can take them a while. So binding agents in forms of like gel foods might be like some gums, locust bean gums, anthin, um, you might see several different algaes, agar is the big one that it, people buy in the supermarket, hence if you want to make your own. I don't find it lasts that long in just a simpler aquarium. Uh, the other one like camargan, uh, another algae based one, you've also got gelatin which I believe is beef based. Um, they all last different amounts of time and availability varies. Um, so you don't really need much of, um, like if you're adding the fish food to it, you don't actually need that much of these gel food binding agents for the actual volume of food. A uh, big um, like argument against gel foods is these binding agents, which yeah, generally are gum based, which you'll find actually in the softer uh, dry foods, so any of the sort of waxy, um, fatty, lipidy ones will probably have those in the gums. Um, I say gums just because I guess that's what they are and whether they're good or bad it's really difficult to say but the volumes are much less as if you're going to have a dry one it seems to me I've never made my own dry food so it's a little bit more difficult to tell so like these aren't as much nutritional ingredients they're just for texture and actually making the food so ideally as little as possible would be best but you still want the food to actually function so they're, they're probably the ingredients that people get a lot the most confused about next is that fillers really depend on the species you're talking about Vegetables are filler to anything that's not eating plants in the wild and that includes algivores who really usually aren't eating on that many plants. And then fish meal is going to be a filler if you're trying to boost that protein content while trying to avoid feeding algae. Um, just because it's probably cheaper I assume. And you'll see it's quite often that you'll find the wrong ingredients to boost certain values that people are claiming to care about or just because they might be cheaper. So the main fillers, that the actual argument against fillers should be those ingredients that the fishes can't digest or have limited digestibility compared to what we can get available because not all ingredients are possible like sponges, rhizoa, uh, stuff like that. But also, yeah, so it's just that digestibility really. Um, so these are common throughout all, well most fish foods 
You also see some like attractive ingredients that are very much sort of on trend, like uh, cellulose powder or wood. No digestibility, no purpose. It's just passing in and out of the fish's gut. It's just because people like to see it on the in the fish food, and that's why they sell it. And that's quite a few ingredients. So one of the big things behind fillers is stems from human foods, I think, particularly. And this is long and unknown names. And it's not rare fish foods do use different names for the same thing. So you might see algae for um, different species of algae, uh, whether it's an algae, it might have one species of algae, it might have 10, 20 different, like 10, 20 I've never seen, but it might have multiple different species of algae rather than just the one but you don't really know and you'll see fish and fish derivatives rather than fish meals and then it gets to ingredients that people aren't really sure what they are like locust bean gum is one you have to look up because you think oh that might be a carnivorous ingredient that is probably a locust but no it's from a plant which a bean kind of suggests and also there's ingredients we don't really know much about as hobbyists or just general people that can get really confusing. And many of these are vitamins or sources of vitamins like brewer's yeast and stuff um, or just the vitamins in general like thiamine and many people think why are we adding these and that then probably leads to the amount of brands that just label um, ingredients just as vitamins and minerals and then it becomes what's actually in it so always there's no harm in googling ingredients and they can be quite different to what you expect there's quite a few things like irish moss i think is a seaweed it's not a moss and you might see different terms used for the same thing it's all there's so many reasons behind it so finally I'm going to talk about the filler that everyone loves to hate but it doesn't actually exist. So this is ash. Almost all foods will list something called ash. And many people will think, oh this must be they're adding ash to bulk out this fish food. And throughout history humans have put various undigestible ingredients in a food to bulk it out. So you're buying less of what you actually want. Uh, bread and milk are particularly bad ones. But actually ash content doesn't mean they're adding ash. Ash you'll notice is actually usually in, I think it's the analytical constituents area. So it'll be next to protein, fats, usually uh, moisture. And this doesn't, this actually means it's not an ingredient. This is because ash actually means the mineral content. What they've done is burned down the fish food or cooked it down to the actual how many minerals are in the food. So that actually doesn't mean that um, ash is bad. It's neutral because it's just how many minerals, how many things don't burn down in the food. And we need all animals and plants, organisms need these minerals in their food. Um, or maybe they take it up through water sometimes, but it's still a really important measure of just how many min vitamins and minerals are in so. So sometimes you might see that high ash content, but that actually might mean it's more as high in vitamins and minerals than another thing. And moisture content I think is the other one, it really depends what you're feeding, but for fishes, do we really need high moisture content or, or do we need low? The, they're in water, we don't really need, it just changes the softness. And there's some quite interesting ingredients that you can add um, for different reasons that might seem like a filler, but they've actually got a purpose. One of the ones I'm experimenting with just um, at the moment for various reasons is actually looking at adding plaster Paris into fish foods to see how it um, to get the food to last much longer in, the, in a, an aquarium than the traditional gelling agents. And this is for a fish that can last because it will just pass through their gut. So there's plenty, and you'll see it actually in weekend blocks have plaster pads and similar ingredients to make them last 
that much, much, much longer. So it's not always as simple as it seems. Ingredients have many names and brands might make claims on the front of the packet, the sides of the packet. Always look at the ingredients and that will give you so much more re, um, understanding. Don't look at, um, like reviews are great, but I always recommend just looking up the ingredients, matching them with what you, your fishes eat in the wild and do researches on what your fishes eat in the wild if you could possibly know. Otherwise there's assumptions you can make based on their body shape, their mouth shape, etc. Um, but anyway, I'm going to end this video here. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe and goodbye.